So we are really lucky to have Dr. Anand Kumar uh, giving our monthly DC sepsis network talk today. I'm going to give him a short introduction here. Uh, Dr. Kumar is an associate professor of medicine in both critical care and infectious disease, as well as medical microbiology and pharmacology therapeutics at the University of Manitoba. He's an attending physician at the Health Sciences Centre at St. Boniface Hospital, Winnipeg. <clears throat> he earned his medical degree from University of Toronto, Ontario, and completed his residency also in internal medicine at University of Toronto. Dr. Kumar then went on to complete fellowships in critical care medicine and cardiovascular research at the Rusk Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago, and then infectious disease at the University of Wisconsin Hospital um, in Wisconsin. He then trained, he is ter currently he's trained in internal medicine, critical care medicine, and infectious disease, and does translational research with interest in sepsis and life-threatening infections. He has over 350 original research manuscripts, review chapters, and abstracts. I consider Dr. Kumar to be not only a mentor, but a friend, and this is truly an honor to have him on a BC Sepsis Network call. And I'll pass it over to you, Anand. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, I'm going to, you know, there's a lot of different aspects of the work that I, that I do, but uh, I am going to uh, focus on what I think will be most relevant to you in terms of improving your patient outcomes which is uh, addressed by the title of this lecture. I take it you can see this, uh, this uh, red uh, laser pointer thing. Uh, you can't put up your hands. Okay. Uh, speed is life, okay? Um, I do want to point out that if you want any of these slides that I'm going to show you and, and many others that I have from my research and from my talks, uh, if you just search my name, Manitoba and Internal Medicine, you'll come to my faculty website and you can just download them. Uh, a list of my papers is there, and attached to the relevant paper are the slides that go with it. Okay, so uh, I think most of you, or a lot of you, I understand a, a lot of you are uh, from the nursing side. There are probably some intensivists and maybe some ID docs. Um, I do want to go over some background first, and what I'd uh, point out is that this is the, the current concept of what sepsis is. It's in this Venn diagram. About 20 years ago, Roger Bone and some of his colleagues who were well-known intensivists at the time knew that we needed to come up with a, a new way of thinking about sepsis because at that time, there were these large studies that were going to be coming down the road of sepsis, you know, large studies, 1,000, 2,000, even 3,000 patients. And uh, there were no consistent definitions of what sepsis was. It was pretty easy in those days to, you know, they were doing these large cardiac trials like uh, Gusto and Timmy trials of myocardial infarction, but it's pretty easy to diagnose myocardial infarction, uh, but relatively difficult to be consistent with uh, definitions of sepsis. People had terms like um, sepsis, uh, bacteremia, life-threatening bacteremia, uh, bacteremia with, with uh, hypotension, um, uh, septicemia, severe sepsis, there were all these different terms. And the problem was that when you were comparing groups, you were always comparing uh, different patient groups. It was always apples to oranges between different studies. And Roger Bowen had the insight that in order to have consistent definitions, you needed to hang the definitions on a, on a, you know, a conceptual framework of what sepsis is. And a central concept that he popularized is this concept of SIRS. If you have a small cut on your arm, you have a localized inflammatory response. You have pain and you have tenderness, you have warmth, uh, and, and, it's, uh, uh, and, and it may be uh, uh, reddened. Uh, on the other hand, if that cut becomes infected and you start to uh, excrete, secrete cytokines and other pro-inflammatory mediators systemically, you start getting chills and rigors and shakes, fever, then you've got a systemic inflammatory response. So what he said was that if you had systemic inflammatory response defined by two of the four of the following, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, altered white count, that is up, down, or left shifted, altered temperature, up or down. If you had two of those four in the context of an appropriate clinical insult, by definition, you had systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And if, on the other hand, that appropriate clinical insult was, in fact, infection, then the overlap of the two would define sepsis. Severe sepsis would be a subset of sepsis where you had organ failure, and septic shock would be even a smaller subset where you specifically had cardiovascular failure or shock. Now, 
there are some interesting uh, implications of this model. One is it suggests that you could look absolutely septic, that is, have SIRS, but if you're not infected, then you don't have sepsis. And in fact, the classic examples of that would be somebody with severe pancreatitis. Those people can look absolutely septic, uh, right down to the point of having shock, but if they're not infected, they don't have sepsis, they just have SIRS. Now, the one thing that I don't like about this conceptual framework is that it you don't see in this diagram that the infection is driving the SIRS. They seem like almost two overlapping independent entities. And in fact, when you think about it, that's really the way that intensivists who have become uh, who have come to dominate thinking about sepsis uh, think about uh, what sepsis and septic shock is. We think, and I'm an intensivist as well, we think, in fact, that yes, there's an infection, but we give these great antimicrobials and the infection is gone just like that. And, and nonetheless, we've triggered a cascade. We always think about sepsis in the context of cascades. We talk about cascades. We talk about inflammatory cascades, infection cascades, cytokine cascades, coagulation cascades. It's all about cascades when you think about sepsis. And the important thing with respect to cascades is that although you may have an upstream trigger, the idea with a cascade is even if you eliminate the trigger, for example, with antimicrobials, the cascade progresses nonetheless, and that's what we think happens. You get the SIRS, you get this anti-inflammatory response uh, syndrome, CARS, compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome, and the interaction of the two over time gives you organ injury. So what's the problem with this model? Well, it's something that any of the ID people uh, listening in right now would, would know automatically, and that is you can't get rid of infections that quickly. Infections don't disappear with a single dose of antimicrobials. They last for days. On average, it takes seven to nine days to get rid of a bloodstream staph aureus infection uh, with vancomycin. It still takes two or three days even with cloxacillin, never mind if you have an abscess or something like that. So ID people think about sepsis in a very different way. And I want to go over this background with you because I want you to understand why time matters, okay? Infectious disease docs have a microbiologic view of what sepsis is. They think there's a focus of infection. And within that focus, the organism load is increasing over time if it's untreated. Overlying is that is the toxic burden of, of uh, antigens released by the bacteria. That's your exotoxins, endotoxins. Even bacterial nucleic acids these days are known to be very antigenic. And they drive the endogenous re inflammatory response. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about cytokines like TNF and IL-1 or eicosanoids, that kind of thing. And then finally, there's what we see as clinicians at the bedside driven by the inflammatory response. We see evidence of cellular dysfunction and tissue injury, which in its ultimate manifestation will lead to septic shock and is septic shock. Okay, what's the problem with this model? Well, in fact, it's something that, that uh, a lot of intensivists and particularly surgeons are aware of, and it's something that this guy probably uh, uh, address best. He, uh, Carl J. Wiggers is the foremost cardiovascular physiologist of the 20th century, and he's famous for a lot of things, but one of the things I think he should be most famous for is his early definition of shock, in which he said, shock is a syndrome resulting from depression of many functions, but in which reduction of the effective circulating volume and blood pressure of basic importance, and which impairment of surge, in which impairment of circulation steadily progresses until it eventuates in a state of irreversible circulatory failure. Now, my guess is most of you are not familiar with the concept of irreversible circulatory failure, or what we call irreversible shock, but it's important to understand what it is in the context of sepsis. What Dr. Wiggers did between the First and the Second World War is he took dogs and he simply bled out their blood volumes uh, and he asked how, how much volume does it take to put the animal into shock and how long can I wait before I reinfuse the blood and still have the animal survive? That is to say, how much and how long a blood loss can an animal survive? And what he found was that 40% of the blood volume would put an animal solidly into shock. And that's basically where the ATLS guidelines of the different grades of hemorrhage come from. You know, the grade one, two, three, and four hemorrhage, he basically defined those. Now, the second aspect of the question that he found, or that he wanted to address was, how long can these animals tolerate the blood being out, you know, while they're in shock? And what he found was that after about an hour to two hours, he could reinfuse the blood back into the animals, and their blood pressure would go up, and then it would fade. And he could put them on a ventilator if they went into respiratory failure, which they did, and then their lungs would start to get worse over time. 
they would go into renal failure, et cetera. Essentially what had happened in these patients, this is something that we see in the ICU all the time and somebody who's been traumatized out in the field and we don't get them back into the unit and resuscitate them fast enough, is they've been irreversibly shocked, right? They're committed to death no matter what you do. These animals, by the way, they didn't die right away, but they died two, three, four days out. They developed multiple organ failure and, uh, and died. So, you know, you guys might not be familiar with the concept of irreversible shock, but I'll bet you all of you have heard of the concept of the golden hour. And the concept of the golden hour derives directly from the concept of uh, from the concept of irreversible shock. A golden hour has been well defined for uh, a hemorrhagic traumatic shock. Basically, with hemorrhagic traumatic shock, if you don't intervene, if you don't address the underlying source of hemodynamic instability, that is the bleeding source, within a very short time, the, the mortality just skyrockets. And it's not enough just to give them fluids or put them on a ventilator to give supportive care. The key determinant of outcome is simply how quickly do you address the underlying source of the hemodynamic instability. And in fact, the concept of the golden hour has been extended to cardiogenic shock. For cardiogenic shock due to massive myocardial infarction, it's the same issue. The key determinant of outcome is simply how fast do you angioplasty, how fast do you open up the ischemic area. Again, it doesn't matter if you put them on balloon pump or epinephrine or adrenaline or, or vasopressors. None of those supportive elements really have a major impact on the outcome. The only thing that has an impact on the outcome is simply how fast you get them to angioplasty or to surgery. And similarly, finally, for obstructive shock, for example, due to massive pulm uh, pulmonary embolus, same thing. If you don't thrombolyze or embolectomize the obstruction in the pulmonary circuit, within an hour or two, the mortality just skyrockets. And again, given fluids or pressors or inotropes or all those things really don't have a huge impact on the outcome. So you can take the same concept and you can apply it to septic shock and create a new model which will help you understand what you have to do in septic shock to get best outcomes. So it combines the two elements that I showed you in the previous models. Again, you have this uh, nidus of infection within which the organism is replicating. So we're talking about a pneumonia or a pyelonephritis, peritonitis, something like that, an abscess. Organism load is increasing. Overlying that is the toxic burden of endotoxin, exotoxin, et cetera, the inflammatory response, and cellular dysfunction tissue injury. Now, I've added two elements to, to this model. One is this line that represents the shock threshold. Now, the shock threshold is simply the point at which any given individual can no longer tolerate the hemodynamic stress that they're under, the cardiovascular stress, and they basically decompensate. They go into shock. Now, the shock threshold for a young, healthy person, like a lot of people I suspect in the room over there, could be way up here. The shock threshold for an old, debilitated person could be way down here. They've got impaired cardiovascular reserve. But the important point to understand is that everybody goes through the same sequence. Everybody, if they're untreated, will eventually cross the shock threshold. And the important point, this is when the clock starts ticking. This is when the golden hour begins. And this is when you become at risk of death. And Essentially, at some point thereafter, you are going to pass the golden hour and you're going to be irreversibly committed to death no matter what you do. And our job is to bring you below the shock threshold in a short enough time that you are not irreversibly committed to death. And how do we do that? Well, you simply ask the question, well, what is the driver of hemodynamic instability in septic shock? And this model would point out to you simply that it's the microbial load. It's the load of organisms causing the disease. So your job is to reduce the load of organism in a short enough time that you're not irreversibly committed to death, that you have not passed the golden hour. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Now, the interesting thing about a model like the one I showed you is that it gives you ideas for um, what may be important in a disease. And there are two interesting implications of this model. One implication of this model is simply this. It suggests that delays to antimicrobial therapy are just a substitute for saying that the microbial load was allowed to increase too much. It's just an indirect way of looking at microbial load. The other really interesting thing about this model is it suggests that sepsis without shock on this side and sepsis with shock or septic shock on this side are fundamentally two different diseases. I'll bet you all of you think about infection 
sepsis, severe sepsis, i.e. sepsis with organ failure, and septic shock is kind of a continuum of disease. And this model would tell you, no, that's not the case. It would say that that basically infection, sepsis, and severe sepsis are one disease, and when you have septic shock, it's fundamentally a different disease that you're dealing with and needs different therapy. Now, can I prove those points? Well, I can give you some suggestive data. I could prove it if I had more time, but look at this. I would say the most suggestive piece of data on the issue of are these different diseases is just look at mortality. If, in fact, sepsis uh, if, in fact, se uh, infection, sepsis, and severe sepsis were different diseases, you would expect to see uh, increasing mortalities all the way through to septic shock. But, in fact, what you see when you look at the data by and large is that you see with infection in the ICU, sepsis in the ICU, or septic shock in the ICU, or, or severe sepsis in the ICU, you always have about 10 to 15 percent mortality. You don't get a significant change in mortality until you get to septic shock when it jumps up to about 40 to 50 percent. And I could show you other pieces of data along the same lines, but this is pretty suggestive. Now, the other point I made is, is that basically increasing microbial load should be associated with septic shock and with death. And here's a simple study of pneumococcal pneumonia and the risk of septic shock. This is by Rello and colleagues in Spain. And they basically demonstrate that the risk of getting septic shock goes up linearly, basically, with the microbial load. So if the microbial load is increased in the blood, more likely you have septic shock. And similarly, the chance of dying when you have uh, uh, pneumococcal septicemia goes up substantially when your microbial load is increased. Okay, so that gets to those two points. Now, as I mentioned, you know, the idea of a model like this is it gives you ideas on how you may be able to apply treatment most effectively. And simply, when we give antimicrobial therapy, this is what we're doing. All right. What we basically do is we give it here. The patient's in shock already. The microbial load decreases. It doesn't decrease instantaneously and disappear, but it decreases over time. The toxic burden follows. The inflammatory response follows. And cellular dysfunction tissue injury settle down over time. And really what we're hoping is that by eliminating the microbial load, we decrease the time above the shock threshold, the time you're in shock, to a short enough period of time that you're not irreversibly damaged, that you haven't passed the golden hour and that you have a shot at uh, making it. Now, what's the simplest way to kind of uh, abbreviate and, and, and shrink this whole process? Well, the simplest way is obviously just give earlier antimicrobial therapy. If you do that, the microbial node load never gets as high. Toxic burden, all these different elements settle down. Yeah, you might go transiently into shock because there's some delay. I'm sure you've all seen the odd patient in the ER, for example, who has uh, very toxic looking but holding their blood pressure. You think they've got pneumococcal sepsis. You give them the antibiotic. You walk away. think you've done a good thing. You get a call in a half an hour, and they say, oh, the patient went hypotensive. Did we do something wrong? And the answer is almost always no. You just give them a little bit of fluids, and they'll, they'll settle down. Or if you're lucky, they never go into shock at all. Now, there is one other way to, to, uh, to get rid of organisms in a hurry, and that is source control. Source control is a different way to eliminate microorganisms, basically. And this actually suggests that antimicrobial therapy and source control should both be additive. So if you, certainly if you give late antimicrobial therapy, maybe the addition of source control will help you even more. So we're going to look at some of these issues, okay? So the basic principles of how to give effective antimicrobial therapy were really enunciated by this guy, Paul Ehrlich, uh, as early as the 17th, uh, sorry, as, as early as 1913, 100 years ago. And he said simply, frappivort, a frappivit, hit hard and hit fast, and we're going to talk about that. Now, there's one other physician, substantially less famous, but uh, he's got his own thing to say, and that's me. I say entre le no, which is get in the ring, and I'm saying that today, so it's not too old, but I think it's uh, at least somewhat as important. The main thing I'm saying is you've got to put your uh, your uh, put yourself in a situation where your antibiotics can do their thing, okay? And that means source control. Now, we have a database of septic shock cases that you guys contributed to. You guys actually in the Vancouver area uh, and in BC, I think, are the second largest contributors to our database. The database is now about 12,000 patients with septic shock, by far the largest database uh, of its sort. And we found about 40% of our patients required source control. And I consider anybody who has a source controllable lesion who has septic shock to have a mandatory requirement for having source control done, you know, if it can be done. 
So in that circumstance, I asked, how often do we even do source control? And I was just appalled to find out, out about, uh, about 5,000 patients that had a requirement for source control. Only about 78% of them ever had it done. Survival in these guys was about 55%. But in the roughly 21% of patients who never had source control done, if they had a definitive requirement to have it, in fact, their survival, as you can see here, was about 3%. So clearly, you have to have source control done if you have that option. Um, now, the other aspect I said was, uh, we said was uh, hit the organism, sorry, it was uh, hit, hit uh, fast and, and hard. We're going to talk about hit fast. And hit fast, there are two elements to that. One is simply that you want to cover the organism at the first opportunity. This is a slide but uh, from a study by Mayer and Colliff and colleagues in St. Louis. And he simply asked, what was the survival in patients admitted to the ICU with positive blood cultures, depending on whether they got an appropriate in green or inappropriate in uh, red antimicrobial? Now, first interesting thing is he found 20% of the time they got the antimicrobial wrong. The survival, if they got it right, sorry, the mortality, if they got it right, was about uh, 25%. And the mortality was more than double if they got it wrong more than doubled. Now, here's an interesting thing. This is uh, mortality of patients not with septic shock, but with bacteremia or fungemia. Why do we study bacteremia and fungemia? Uh, you know, I'll tell you something really interesting. Um, almost all the information you get from the infectious disease docs about how to best treat life-threatening infections is based on bacteremia. So the question you've got to ask, though, is do we care about bacteremia if somebody, you know, to admit somebody to the ICU? And the answer is no, we don't. If somebody were to call me and say, you know, Dr. Kumar, we've got to admit this guy. He's got bacteremia. I'd laugh at them. I'd say, I don't care about bacteremia. Does he have shock? Is he in respiratory failure? What's, I'm, I care about organ failure. Bacteremia, the reason they study bacteremia is simply this. It's easy to find a list of all the cases of bacteremia you've had in your hospital for the last 10 years because you can just go ask your micro lab. They've all been computerized for at least 25 years. Whereas there's never been a diagnostic admission code for septic shock until relatively recently. So if you try to find your septic shock cases, unless you have an internal ICU database, you can't find them. And, you know, it'd be much more uh, relevant to find cases of septic shock. Why is it relevant? Well, because when you ask, okay, we're going to predicate our or base our treatment of septic shock antimicrobially based on, on bacteremia cases or positive blood culture cases, well, only 3% of cases of bacteremia or fungemia have septic shock. So you're predicating treatment for septic shock based on basically a group of whom only 3% actually have the condition you're interested in, which is a bit of a problem. But we have actually looked at septic shock, uh, per se, in our database. Uh, this was about 5,000 patients, and the data is here. What you see here in turquoise is this is our hit rate on this side. The hit rate is the percent that the initial antimicrobial therapy is appropriate for the organism isolated. And what you see here is that we have about 80% appropriateness and about 45, 43% survival. Culture positive, culture negative, bacteria positive, negative. Community has a higher percent appropriateness and higher survival than does nosocomial. This is pneumonia, intra-abdominal infection, skin and soft tissue, UTI, catheter-related infection, laboratory-confirmed bloodstream infection. As you can see, as the hit rate or percent appropriateness goes up and down, survival tracks really nice with, nicely with it. If you look now at the survival in those who get appropriate initial therapy and inappropriate initial therapy, 55% versus 11%. We're not, no, no longer talking about a doubling of the mortality risk. We're talking about a five-fold 500% difference in survival, just depending on whether you get appropriate initial antimicrobials that cover the organism given on the first dose, even if you correct it later. Look at this, laboratory-confirmed bloodstream infections without an obvious clinical source. A lot of these are candida or um, staph aureus infections. Candida in, in neutropenics, staph aureus infections generally where there's not an obvious clinical source. Look at this, 48% survival if you cover it, 3% survival if you don't cover it. Um, 
does it relate to outcome on an on a institutional basis? Absolutely. This is uh, survival for the cohort to hospital discharge. This is percent appropriateness. You could put a line right through there. Generally speaking, our community hospitals have higher uh, numbers than do our academic places by and large, but presumably we get more resistant bugs at the academic places. Um, why do we miss as often as we do? Well, I think the main thing is that all of us who do this kind of work know that there are certain groups of people that need broad-spectrum therapy. The patients who are classically immunosuppressed, lymphoma, leukemia, myeloma, metastatic malignancy, chemotherapy, neutropenia. This is the percent of patients that have those. The problem is a lot of the people that are at the tip of the spear, so to speak, that is the people that are the first contact with patients with septic shock, the guys in ER, the residents on the ward, don't always realize that chronic organ failure, cirrhosis, liver failure, COPD, chronic renal failure, uh, hemodialysis, diabetes mellitus, these patients are uh, not immunosuppressed, but they are immunocompromised in a broader sense, and they also require broad spectrum therapy. Now, if you add those up, all those co comorbidities, about 70%, those who've had surgery or are a recent surgery or otherwise nosocomial, that's 80%. Adding those that are 75 years old or older who are at risk for resistant infections, that's 90%. 90% of patients with septic shock should be getting broad spectrum therapy. And the problem is the people at the tip of the spear, the people who really matter in terms of initial therapy, don't always know that. And I have to say, I have to point out that it's really those the guys that define the ceiling of outcome for uh, for uh, septic shock uh, survival. I mean, basically the intensivists and the ID guys like to think that we have a big role, but really we don't. Um, the intensivist role is basically not to screw things up. Excuse me just a minute. Uh, call you back uh, later, okay? I'm on a lecture. Um, uh, our job is not to screw things up. The the uh, the role of the and make things worse. The role of the uh, ID doc is to help you de-escalate therapy, but outcome is defined in the first couple hours. How often do we actually achieve uh, decent coverage? This is data from Manitoba. Um, you know, we, we looked at people with standard risk and high risk over a five-year period. And the first thing to notice is that the high-risk patients, those at risk of resistant organisms, ten times larger than the uh, the standard risk people, 391 to 37, this over a five-year period. The other thing to notice is only these two groups comprising 60 patients over five years out of a total of about 800, only 60% or about 7% total, uh, 60 of them, 7% total or so, actually achieve greater than 95% coverage of pathogens. I mean, if your dad was coming in with a life-threatening septic shock and I told you, Oh, don't worry about it. We've got 80% coverage. That wouldn't cover it. You want that wouldn't cut it. You'd want 95% or better coverage. It's only these groups. The other groups all are under 85%. So that's the, hit, the issue of hitting the organism appropriateness. Now we're going to look specifically at the issue of time. So we asked a question basically some time back. Uh, when I started this study, we simply asked the nurses around the ICU and ER, how long does it take to initiate antimicrobial therapy, appropriate antimicrobial therapy, once docu uh, documentation of hypotension has been made? We have documented hypotension. And the answer was an hour, maybe two hours. So I went to look at that because it's easy to do. As you know, nurses uh, typically will document uh, hypotension immediately if it uh, looks of concern, and you have to write down the time antimicrobials are given, so that's easy to find. So we, we timed it out. And we looked at our place initially at Health Sciences, and we were, we were flabbergasted. So then I said, you know what, the, the guys across the street at St. Boniface Hospital, which is on the Fred side of town, uh, are uh, are clearly smart, and uh, they're, they're French after all. And uh, they said, yeah, we'll be better than that, and they checked. and. Frankly, they were the same as us. So I called my friends in Toronto where the people are absolutely brilliant. I trained there. And uh, again, if, uh, if you ask the guys there, if you're not sure they're brilliant, you can just ask them. They'll, they'll tell you. And they said, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, you've been out in the West too long. Uh, we do things much better here. So they were kind enough to measure their numbers. They were two hours longer than us. And I asked my American friends. And they were about the same as Toronto. And so I was t completely flabbergasted to find that the median time to get antimicrobials on board was six hours. Now, if you got your appropriate antimicrobials on board in, uh, in 30 minutes, and, and there were only about 5% of the patients total that did it that fast, your survival could be as high as 90%. In the next half hour, we got up to a total of about 12% of patients who had gotten antimicrobial therapy, survival there 84%. 
Thereafter, for every hour delay out to six hours, the projected survival dropped by about 7.5%. 7.5% per hour. If you guys remember activated protein C being available, that gave us a 6% absolute improvement in survival at a cost of $10,000 a course of therapy. I can tell you, if you can just shorten your antimicrobial time down by by an hour, you can get more than that amount of survival uh, improvement. And I can tell you, it'll cost you a hell of a lot less than $10,000. For $20,000, you could do a program for a large hospital for a year. This is the uh, fra this is the survival against antimicrobial delay. We took all our cases of septic shock, we put them in order of how fast they got antimicrobials, and then we did a running average of 250 for survival. And as you can see, survival st starts in the mid 80s and then just drops like a stone. This is the logarithmic decay curve, flattens after about 24 hours, and these are probably misdiagnoses. Basically, if you look at the cumulative number of survivors, if you don't get your antimicrobial therapy in uh, it, within the first 12 hour. Only 10% of survivors occur after that. This is the adjusted odds ratio of survival per hour delay, okay, for to these different time intervals. Uh, and as you can see, if you get your antimicrobial therapy in the second hour of hypotension compared to the first hour, your chance of dying is already statistically increased and it skyrockets from there. We've actually repeated this work with much larger numbers because this was 2,000 patients. We can actually show a statistical break point at 20 minutes or so. In fact, roughly in the first hour, for every five minute delay in getting effective antimicrobials on board, it's about a 1% uh, in, in, uh, increase in uh, projected mortality. Does this apply to all subgroups? Yeah, it applies to every subgroup you'd want to look at, every one of them. If you want a rough estimate of survival, survival equals 0.79, which is the survival in the first hour, 79% survival, if you exclude nobody at all. The previous slide, we excluded people who were moribund or got CPR in the field or stuff like that. But this one excludes nobody at all. Take 0.79, divide by 1.112 to X, where X is the hour's delay, and that'll give you a very accurate uh, projection of survival with increasing delays. Uh, is this associated with outcome? Absolutely. These are 30 different hospitals in our database, including five or six in your area, uh, maybe uh, five or six there, uh, uh, two of the big hospitals in uh, three, four, five hospitals in Vancouver, and uh, three on the island. So you're well represented here, and as you can see, you could put a line right through this. Increasing delays, decreasing survival. Uh, does it apply to organ failure? Yeah, exactly the same thing. This is uh, dialysis. Uh, this, is the, um, the, this is the probability of developing acute kidney injury, and again, just tracks with increasing delays. And I can show you this for acute lung injury, for all sorts of other things. So... I think it's really important to take a few minutes. Uh, I know we're kind of running late, and I, I apologize for that. Uh, are we okay to keep going? Uh, Dave, can we? Uh... Yep, we've got time, so feel okay. free to keep going. All right, so let's talk about delays, because I think this is really important. Failure to rec What are the causes for delays? Failure to recognize that hypertension represents septic shock is a major player. Okay, it's a major thing, but I would have predicted that. The effect of inappropriate antibiotic initiation, as we discussed before, also a very big deal there. And again, we would have guessed that. For example, failure to appreciate the risk of resistant organisms in certain scenarios. We talked about immunocompromised versus immunosuppressed, but we also tend to underestimate antecedent antimicrobial use. But the ones that drove me nuts were the really mundane, silly things that as an intensivist, I'd never thought of. For example, I was told by the, our ER nurses, we'd be giving our antibiotics a lot faster, but you doctors are always writing, uh, draw blood cultures and then give antibiotics. And the problem is our uh, IV techs are, are uh, you know, very stretched thin, and uh, by union rules, the nurses were not supposed to do blood cultures. And so typically you'd call an IV tech, they'd be backed up, and even stat it would take 45 minutes to an hour. And so that was a big problem. Transfer from the ER before antibiotics are given. Academic hospitals, uh, you're, uh, and all hospitals, are, are pressed for time. You want to move people out. Problem in academic hospitals is that once the patient is transferred out of the ER, if you haven't given the antibiotics there, they go to a new new uh, team on the on the floor, and the new team has to assess and address the patient. The orders from the ER aren't carried out. Failure to use that stat orders, and that'll delay things by about two hours. By the way, uh, I always assume that 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 uh, you know the nurses in the in the in the ICU and the ER are the best nurses in the hospital, uh, by and large. And I figure, well, 
Yeah, of course it's stat. Everything's stat with these patients. But you fail to use stat orders, uh, they'll be done routine, at least in some cases if you've got junior nurses on board. And as the pharmacists among you may know, if you don't use stat orders and you wait for the routine thing, say you come in at, uh, at uh, well, take a drug that's given twice a day, like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin, if you order it, uh, you know, 400 uh, Q12 hours, the guy comes in at, uh, say, uh, 11 a.m., and your standard times for giving it are 10 a.m. and 10 p.m., they wait 11 hours. Just by doing that, you've killed that patient. A friend of mine recently looked at this, uh, Peter Brindley in uh, Edmonton, and showed that about 3 to 4% of the time this was happening. He swore to me it never happened in his uh, hospital and in his ICU. He's one of those guys who lives there all the time. I bet him that uh, he could measure it, and he found 3 or 4% of the time it was happening. Another one is failure to recognize the presence of inappropriate antimicrobials equals no antimicrobials at all when responding to clinical failure. You come in in the morning as an attending. Uh, the patient hasn't done well overnight. You say, oh, you've given them the wrong antibiotic. Uh, let's go from, uh, from cefuroxime and put them on, I don't know, marrow or piptase or something. And the nurse says to you, well, because you're rounding it uh, at uh, – you know, 11 a.m., and she says to you, well, we just gave him the dose of uh, whatever it is before, 10 minutes ago. Should we wait until the next dosing interval to give Piptazo? And you, not thinking about it, say, yeah, of course, uh, we don't want him to seize, but here's the problem. It's the wrong antimicrobial. It's like no antimicrobial. You know, you wait until 10 p.m., it's 11 hours, you probably just killed the patient. Here's another one. I've done that myself. Here's another one. Um, when you give antimicrobials for septic shock, you usually don't give one antimicrobial. Typically, you give several. Now, of those several, one is your go-to drug. It's usually Piptase or Meripenem or some drug like that, usually a beta-lactam. But you're often given two others kind of as supplemental agents, say vancomycin and an aminoglycoside. But of those, it's the Piptase or the Mero that's your go-to drug. But it's also your most expensive drug. So which host, which uh, a drug do you suppose your hospital makes it a little bit harder for you to get your hands on, right? Nurses don't give these drugs in order that, in the order that they're they're written down. They give them in order of how, which ones they can get first. Flagyl, vancomycin, aminoglycosides, they're all dirt cheap. They're in virtually every drawer in the hospital. So you write, write these three drugs, you end up giving uh, one of these first, like vancomycin. Now, vancomycin is a, a good agent in terms of uh, breadth of coverage, but it's a weak agent, okay? And it only covers about 10 or 15% of your pathogens uniquely. It takes an hour and a half to give. Nurses don't typically give more than one drug at a time. So basically what you end up doing is you end up delaying your go-to drug, the one that covers 90% of your pathogens, by a good three, four hours in order to give two sub uh, 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 you know, uh, two suboptimal agents, basically, like aminoglycosides. Basically, you've potentially increased your mortality risk uh, of death probably about by about 30% just by doing that. Um, so what do we do? Well, we suggest that the presence of hypotension in a patient with known or suspected infection should be considered to be septic shock in the absence of a definitive alternate explanation. Look, somebody comes in with a crushing retrosternal chest pain who's diabetic and three millimeters ST elevation, but they've got a bit of an infiltrate on their chest x-ray, I'll buy that their shock is due to cardiogenic shock due to MI. If you've got a known cirrhotic with three liters of blood on the floor, but they've got some white cells in the urine, again, I'll buy uh, um, uh, you know, an alternate explanation. But short of that, if you have hypotension without an obvious clinical source, I think you should assume it's septic shock. And with an infection, you should assume it's septic shock. We say no transfers from the ER before antibiotics are given. That's a citywide requirement for us now. All initial IV orders for any IV antibiotic are automatically stat. By the way, even if this has to be given IM, we'll do it IM if we have to. We have syndrome-based algorithm-driven guidelines similar to meningitis and neutropenic sepsis with uh, you know, basically broad-spectrum antimicrobial regimens at each of our centers. We don't think you know, is this pneumonia, is this abdominal sepsis? We just give the same thing for septic shock as a syndrome. And our order has a sequence and a time limit, i.e. initiate septic cure-all within 30 minutes of the order because nobody likes doing an incident report when, uh, that, uh, when they fail. Uh, we give simultaneous multiple antibiotics in septic shock. And one of the most important things for our ER docs and for our uh, senior residents is we teach them that the first IV dose of most broad-spectrum agents, that is beta-lactams, carbapenems, can be given push by the physician as they do in the, uh, in the emergency room, sorry, in the uh, OR. Basically, you, give, uh, you basically tell the uh, pharmacist, uh, take them the order set, 
they give you the drug labeled. Uh, you check uh, the possibility of, uh, of anaphylaxis with the nurse, tell them what you're doing, push it in, boom, you're done. You know, you've avoided all the problems. Okay, so just one other thing I want to cover really briefly, and that is source control, okay? Source control is just important in terms of time to uh, implementation, as is antimicrobial therapy. This is uh, the graphic. Our median time to source control was about 12 hours. But as you can see, for every delay, our survival dropped. Here's a really interesting uh, slide here. Uh, source control, by the way, again, it's a good QA measure, time to source control. But here's a really interesting uh, slide. I think that you should ideally be less than six hours on source control. Six to 24 is where we are. Greater than 24 is bad. I think you should be less than three hours as a target for antimicrobials, preferably less than one. Three to six is where we are. Greater than six is where you don't want to be. Look at this, 92% survival, 46% survival, 13% survival. It's an amazing uh, observation. What could we do if we had the opportunity? Well, this is door to balloon time and mortality in acute myocardial infarction in a in a American data set. If you could get them all below two hours, you would save about 5,000 lives a year in the United States. If you t this is time to antimicrobial therapy in our data set. If you could get them all to under two hours, you would save 35,000 lives a year in uh, in uh, the United States, about 3,000 lives a year in Canada. And just to show you that can be done, this is our data. This is antimicrobial delay. This is the year for all the hospitals in our city. Our hospitals, some of them are small community places, but as you can see, at the Health Sciences Center, we've gone from about eight hours in 93, 95, down to about three and three quarters hour now. Overall in the city, we're down to about three hours. And look at our survival. We have gone from 30, 40% survival here, and then here we've got about 45% survival. We've jumped up to about 65% survival. We've dropped our time to antimicrobial uh, uh, therapy by three hours. We would estimate we should get roughly 20 to 25% survival improvement, and that's exactly what we've seen. So thank you for your time. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Nan. That was a, a fantastic talk, and as always, Whenever I hear you talk, I feel like I, I've learned something. Um, maybe I'll start off with a question, then we'll, we'll uh, open up to the group. Actually, before a question, I want to just maybe say one comment. And I, I, I'm really glad that you emphasized um, the timing of source control, because I think that's something as eMERGE docs and ICU physicians that we really need to push for. And I, I can tell you how often I'll see someone who, let's say, has an acute cholecystitis and um, on a couple of mics of Levo and uh, either the interventionists or the surgeon um, ask if we can wait till morning time or whatever. And yeah. I know that uh, we really need to push for interventions and the less insult on the patient, the better. And no, it Absolutely. can't wait till morning. It has to happen now. Absolutely. We um, think because we're giving them pressors that they're not taking a hit, but they're still taking a hit. Without question. Um, the, the two questions I did have for you, the first one is, what do you think about the cryptogenic shock patient um, and the analysis of the Jones trial and um, a couple other papers in the last few years that show that if you have uh, a map greater than 65, let's say, or and uh, not in a macrovascular shock, but you have this elevated lactate uh, greater than 4, what, what are your feelings on those, those people and also the studies that show that if you're hypotensive but don't have a high lactate, Maybe your mortality is not as bad. And how, how much do you think we need to emphasize the treatment of those people? I, I think that, you know, I'm looking at a very narrow thing, uh, you know, because it's easy to look at. It's easy to document when hypotension occurs. Because we do lactate serially, that's harder to, to lack, look at in terms of timing. Uh, I don't doubt that there are cases, particularly people like, uh, if, you, if you look at the cryptogenic shock, a lot of those patients, you know, that uh, concept was developed in, in Detroit, where they have a lot of hypertensive patients who don't have health care. So, you know, basically, if you have a patient whose normal blood pressure runs a 90 or, or 100, uh, 100 uh, mean, and they go down to 80, that could be hypotensive for them. So, I don't, I don't have any any problem with that. And I agree that that you know, the patients who don't have lactates uh, will have lower mortality rates. But I guess what I'm getting at is that basically, um, this is a situation where you want to be um, 
you know, liberal in your definition of, of who needs treatment because the ramifications of making a mistake are so great. Having said that, I want to really emphasize that if you use this aggressive approach in septic shock, you have to be just as aggressive on the de-escalation side. And that's a whole different lecture, but you have to be as aggressive. You know, what it comes down to is simply this. If you make a mistake in terms of coverage or late start of therapy in septic shock, there's a tremendous impact. But once they're stabilized, once they are off pressors or once they're improving, you can make a mistake and you won't increase the mortality risk. So if you don't de-escalate just as aggressively, you short therapy, um, you're going to have a real problem with your resistance. So I think you've got to be prepared to say, I'll de-escalate if it turns out this is not shock or not septic shock. 100% totally agree. Um, my, my second question before I open it up to the rest of the group is what are, which patient groups do you personally think need um, early antifungal therapy? Um, let's exclude the neutropenic patients, which I think most people would agree we would start antifungals, but what patient groups do you start um, antifungal therapy, let's say, on the ward or in the emergency room? Um, would it be patients that have an upper GI source that is perforated, or do you have any sort of algorithm for, those, for, for um, that antimicrobial? Yeah, we, we do, you know, and, and we're, again, we're, we're talking just about septic shock here, okay? So we, we basically ask, we, we put a list of, of risk factors down. So if you have TPN, that's a high risk factor. If you've had a prolonged line, that's a high risk factor. If you have multiple antibiotics for more than five days, that's a risk factor. Uh, renal failure, we can say on dialysis, that's a risk factor. Um, and also uh, cirrhotics, uh, we consider that a risk factor. So we look at the general picture. So we, we don't have a defined group, but what I will say, and I think what you're getting at is that, that about 7% of all patients with septic shock uh, will turn out to have candida septic shock. And we, we never treat that, and that's why the mortality of that condition is like 90%. In fact, when, when you delay adjust the mortality of candida septic shock, the mortality is actually just the same as bacterial septic shock. It just happens that the median time to get antifungals on board if you have fungal septic shock is 36 hours, right? So it's so long that they're just all going to die. I will tell you, David, though, that as we've looked at our data the last five or six years, with the decrease in use of TPN, which seems to be happening on a national level, we seem to be seeing a lot less candida septic shock than we used to in the ICU. And I think it's related to the decreased use of TPN. It's down to about three or four percent nationally rather than seven percent among the septic shock cases. Interesting, because uh, I'm sure, as in your centers and ours, often you'll see people on the ward that have a central line in for the last week or more, or a pick line and have been a multiple antimicrobials, and then they have recurrent septic shock. Yeah. And should we place these people in antifungals as we're bringing them to the ICU, or do you wait to see if they don't respond, et cetera? No, I, 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 if, if I think they're high risk, I, I treat them up front, again, for the reason that I mentioned. If you get it wrong, they're dead, basically, right? So if I think they're significantly high risk, I'll treat it empirically, but then I'll de-escalate it, you know, if after a couple of days uh, they're settling down, basically, right? But, I, but I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, still yeah. go with it. I would say about 20% of my patients, I'll put them on an empiric antifungal, like a and a kind of cannon, 15 to 20%, I'll put them on an empiric and a kind of cannon. And every now and then I'll pick one up where, you know, yeah, they grow it out of their blood or from multiple sites, and they probably would have died if I hadn't done that. Definitely. Okay, uh, maybe I'll open up to the group here. I see a hand up by Sherry. Go ahead, Sherry. Oh, hi. We had a question at Lionsgate about giving antibiotics push. We're not familiar with that. So is this something that's new, or have we not been um, in the loop on this? Uh, well, no, your, your, your anesthesia guys are in the loop. Uh, you know, again, this isn't something that nurses typically do. The nurses uh, typically give it the way it's written up, and they say I think it's an infusion over half an hour or something like that. But, but the, the uh, anesthesia guys have always given beta-lactams by push. And you can give any beta-lactams. So those are drugs like penicillins, carbapenems, uh, cephalosporins, all of those drugs can be given basically as a push uh, over a few minutes, basically, or even just as a straight push. That's well known. Um, they say that piptazo, you're not supposed to do that, uh, but just so you understand, 
the reason for piptazo, and, and you can check this with your pharmacist, it's not because there's a toxicity issue. It's because the pip and the tazo are eliminated uh, at different speeds. And if you give it push, your tazobactam disappears in the six-hour interval earlier than the piperacillin. So at the tail end of therapy, you only have piperacillin around. But it's not a toxicity issue. All that that means is you just give your second dose a little bit earlier, basically, and, and you can work that out with your pharmacist. So is but yeah, yep. Sorry, Dave, is this something that emergency physicians would be taking on in the eMERGE? Oh, I definitely think we could, and I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, I have to say nowhere else um, that I'm aware of right now in BC is anyone doing that, but I think it's something we should really consider looking at because it's a, ga a way to guarantee that our patients are getting the antimicrobials that we're ordering. Yeah, it, it allows you to bypass a lot of the uh, logistic delays, basically. And uh, we teach it to all our ICU fellows, and uh, a lot of our ER guys have been picking it up as well. But it's not, it's not a common thing, but it's an easy thing to do. Because as I said, the anesthesia guys do this in the OR on a routine basis. Yeah, I was going to say, we, there, oh, there, I was just going to say, there's a few things that can be given push that we have, and it's written into our, <clears throat> in, into our sepsis protocol, give first dose push. But um, yeah, pip, uh, and impenum, it's that, you know, the, the, the common references you go to say must be given over 30 minutes. Yeah, but, but again, for piptazo and, and for imipenem as well, the issue is just the differential elimination of the, the two components. There's there's no loss of um, there's no toxicity issues. It just means that uh, basically you have to give your next dose a little bit early. It's no big deal, and it's much more important to give the drug early and get levels uh, up quickly than it is to worry about the you know the tail end of the first dose. Great. Any more questions out there? One more, Brent. You know, the Brent you already asked. No, right? no, that was me. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, well, it's, it's 10 o'clock now. Um, I want to thank Dr. Kumar again for that fantastic talk. We really appreciate it, and we'll make sure this is uh, distributed amongst the province for everyone that couldn't make it this morning. And so thank you, Dr. Kumar, and I think Shari just has a few words for us before we sign off. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank everybody for coming again. Uh, it's been, and, it's, and thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. It's been great to have you here. Um, the video recording will be available on our website uh, as well as the slides, so uh, feel free to go there in a couple of days and uh, you'll see it there. If you have any colleagues who missed it, you can, might want to pass on the link to them. Um, if you are not currently a member of our BC Sepsis Network, um, please go to our website, bcsepsis.ca, um, and click on Sepsis on the toolbar in the left-hand side. And under the BC Sepsis Network page, you'll see a blue button to join the network. And then uh, uh, there's no commitment to joining, but you'll be uh, made aware of all of our upcoming learning sessions. And we've got some, some great ones coming up throughout the rest of the year. Sherry, if, uh, so, just, to, just to mention, can they hear me still? Yes. Yeah, just to mention, feel free to download the slides from that website I mentioned. Like I said, all my original slides that are available are right there, and most of the ones I showed you are there. It's very generous of you. Thank you so much, Nick. Okay. Yeah, feel free to use it. All right. See you. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody, for joining, and have a great day.